You guys are nice. <laughs> Thank you. You don't see that every day. That's pretty small. Well, you guys might, but I, not most people. Uh, there are there are other actresses and actresses here. Yeah, a company with us. We should mention them. Sure, please. You want to any? Uh, you want to introduce them or should who? Please do see. <laughs> <laughs> Right, Tony? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is Eddie. Yeah. Okay, so. Take it down. Tony Hill. Linda Lavin. Linda Lavin. Yeah, I'm ready. Who are you? So, uh, I would like to begin by asking each of you if we can uh, talk about the fact, I guess, like, when. In your memory, did I Love Lucy, the actors, when were they first on your radar? I know Nicole and Javier, you obviously grew up outside of this country. Were they a presence in your lives before you came here? Nicole? Yeah, I feel like um, Lucille Ball has been around a part of life forever. I, I, I feel like she's always been there. And so that's because as a child, I would, would watch the show and um, and laugh, and it wasn't that I grew up with the show, but when I was home from school, or it was on during the day, and it was sort of like a, it was comfort, you know? Javier? Uh, I didn't have any idea. The show was not popular in Spain. The Kilo Luffy, I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I heard about it and many years, I mean like six, seven years ago, about the project, and I started to watch the shows and see who this, this yarn is. And I immediately fell in love with her, of course. With both of them, with everyone in the show. <laughs> Nina? I have a long history with I Love Lucy, but for me personally, I grew up until I was 12 in New Jersey without cable. <laughs> and network television somehow carried many, many an episode of I Love Lucy, so I just adored her as a child. JK? I'm the only one who was alive when it was on, so. <laughs> Yeah. I was born during season four, <laughs> and, uh, and then of course the Lucy and Jesse comedy hour, and you know, I mean, and, and of course it's never not been on television in some form or another in reruns. So yeah, I remember as a young kid, probably kindergartner or maybe a year before, watching it on my parents' gigantic 12-inch black and white TV <laughs> with, uh, with mom and dad and my older sister, and uh, and I oddly identified with uh, the old bald fart who played the lamb. <laughs> Well, let's, uh, let's talk about how each of you came to this. Javier, you teased what I'm going to ask you about, but Nicole, uh, you have played many real people, uh, people who actually live, a number of them famous. You won an Oscar for playing one of them. You played even, in fact, some, uh, another uh, TV-related, American TV-related film even. But I feel like playing somebody this iconic um, and beloved might be intimidating even for somebody as talented as you. As, am I projecting or is this, was it a little bit daunting? Insanely daunting. <laughs> um, but as an actor, when Aaron Sorkin sends a screenplay and says, I'm interested in you for this role, it's like a gift and it's like, okay, yeah, uh, uh, please, I'm, oh, wow. And so, yes was immediate, and then it was like, oh, now I gotta do it. <laughs> the idea of doing it is great. Um, and then it was like the, what we call in Australia, the hardy uh, had to, you know, go in. And that was, um, the, luckily, I had months to prepare, and that's what was needed. And I'm going to definitely follow up on that in a moment. But Javier, uh, uh, again, you've said you you became aware of the show, I guess, about seven years ago. I understand that before anybody else pretty much was attached, including Aaron Sorkin, you were pretty adamant that you wanted to play Desi. What was the what made you fall in love and go after it that aggressively? It would be easy to see what was the knot that I fell in love with. I guess, uh, but basically, he was a pioneer, he was a revolutionary, he was a man that was standing for what he thought he was right, uh, he was super talented, he was madly in love with his wife, 
and uh, he was a foreigner in the 50s in this country trying to really make a stamp of his own origin and, and uh, trying to make himself, his, his, himself be valued for what he was, you know, from the origin that he was coming from, many things. Yeah. Uh, JK, Aaron Sorkin has said that he was thinking about you from the beginning for the part of Bill Ferrelli because of something that happened literally decades ago where you uh, really blew him away. Can you just share, this is kind of an example of you never know when, you know, uh, who's watching, right? Or, or, what, or what's important. Anyway, please take it away. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, and it's a great story for actors because I was <laughs> uh, fortunate to get an audition to be a replacement understudy in the original Broadway production of A Few Good Men. Um, got the job. I was the understudy for a character, a doctor, who was not in the film, um, and for Lieutenant Colonel Nathan Jessup, uh, played by Jack Nicholson brilliantly in the movie. Um, and uh, after several weeks of, of uh, standing in attention and standing in the wings, I had an opportunity to go on. Aaron, you know, the play had been running for a year. He was already the toast of the town, but uh, he got a call that uh, the understudy was going on, and he generously came to watch the performance and, uh, and came backstage afterwards. And uh, we had uh, one of those meetings of the mind and the heart and the soul that, uh, they, that we all get to have sometimes in this business with, with actors or directors and writers. And uh, I get goosebumpy every time I talk about it. It, it remains to this day um, a, a, a top, on one hand, a top highlight of my career as an actor. And it was four performances, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for hundreds of people. And then, uh, and then I went back to uh, standing at parade rest eight times a week uh, when, the, <laughs> when the other actor came back from vacation. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna hijack these proceedings for just one minute because we have a room full of actors here. Um, I have never been a part of a movie with a better ensemble cast. There are 64 actors in this film in principal role. This is the depiction of the best ensemble of this year. Come on, sir. Thank you. Here, here. Absolutely. And uh, just to come back to the Sorry, but you were saying a moment ago. What? It took him 30 years to follow up on that. He 31, no, 30 well. years. <laughs> <laughs> no, and we, we, we had some near misses over the years, and, and uh, you know, either it was, you know, there was a schedule thing, or this or that, or, or you know, so the things just never aligned. And, uh, um, and then, you know, thankfully, I got, to, I got the blessing of, of this one, and, and I hope I don't wait another 31 years, because I'm going to be a little old by now. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of, Theater, uh, Nina Aaron Sorkin has said that he first, like a lot of us, became aware of you from your work in the theater. Youngest person ever to get back-to-back -to -back Tony nominations, one for the second, and he, I guess, put it together that somehow made the association that Vivian Vance had also really had her roots in, in theater and uh, before coming and have establishing herself on the screen. I guess, how did you first become aware of his interest in you for this? Aaron's interest? Yes. Well, it starts with a phone call to put yourself on tape. <laughs> and uh, you then realize you're at the height of the pandemic and you're not technically savvy. <laughs> so you get your best girlfriends to come over and light you like a Christmas so tree. <laughs> and then you get someone else who has maybe a cousin who does theater to run lines with you off screen. And you cross your fingers and you hope for the best. And <laughs> So, I don't know, again, I, I'm probably the only person in this room who's not an actor, but I want to ask you guys, is there anything hard, it sounds to me, to be performing as someone who's performing? Have, what, is there anything prior that you would, uh, you know, in, in your own careers that you would compare it to and that maybe helped you to go into this one to do that? It seems like there's so many things you have to be doing at once. Nicole? I mean, that, that's a separate thing. I think when you're dealing with Sorkin text, and we do call it the Sorkin text, because there is, Aaron Sorkin has a particular way of writing, and when you read his writing, you go, 
this is, um, it's very difficult, it's very um, verbose, but it's also superb. Um, having done a stage play four years prior uh, led me to be able to do this. It's interesting how each job you go, ah, okay, that was preparing me for this. And so I'd done a, a play in London called Photograph 51, which had a lot of science, scientific jargon. And thus, when the Sorkin text came, I'm like, okay, now. And, um, and that was really, really helpful because he is a particular way of, of speaking, behaving, and then you have to bring in the emotion and not get stuck in the words. Absolutely. And, um, and it's a remarkable blow. Once it, once it starts, it's like, wow, this is rhythm and it flows. And then it's like, Whoa. and I think all the actors would say that, and as actors here, you know, you have to learn your lines way ahead of time. Was, you don't come to the set and go, I'm gonna feel my way through this. Well, because part of it is like, like I guess many of the best writers, there's no improvising or going off, off book with Sorkin right up here. No, uh, <laughs> but I was the one in the room that could do that uh, because I one word, one word, one word here, one co-mother. <laughs> because I'm a foreigner playing a foreigner, and I would say, I don't, I don't see this right. I think he will never say that word. Really? <laughs> uh, I remember one of the first things that I see in the movie is "no" when she slaps me, which means "coño." But in Cuba, it's cuño. And he was, what does that mean? I said, well, that means count. Yeah, like fuck in Cuba. And he was like, really? He didn't write that word. He said, well, but if you're a slap and you're a Cuban, you would say cuño. He was like, okay. And I was like, well, I made it. Put a word in Toronto Circus. And Nina and JK, are, have, I guess, would theater prepare you? or prepare anyone to be able to learn the just the amount of dialogue that he puts in your guys' mouths. There's what's how how do you learn Sorkin dialogue? It seems very intimidating, very daunting. Um, I, I look at Mr. Sorkin's dialogue with Aaron. I don't know, but what am I allowed to do? Lord Sorkin. Lord Sorkin. <laughs> <laughs> As, uh, music. Really, because if anyone's ever studied like Oscar Wilde or Shakespeare, if you don't listen to the musicality of what you're doing, it doesn't work, right? It feels the same way with Aaron Sorkin in a sense, where if you don't follow what's happening and earn your pauses in the best way possible, as you would with music where you have to know where to take your breath, it's a very similar experience. Uh, to learning the script. Also, don't miss a word. <laughs> Articles matter. It's a the, not an at. Like you, it's very to the T, and it means something to him, which then means, of course, everything to me. And I think all of us having a theater background, just to say, yeah. going back, I think it's very important because these are people who lived at a time where 60 million, am I right? People watched it a week. Households. Households, not people, households. And so, yeah, you're doing it in front of a live audience. And all of us have that experience of working in the theater, which means it's not just you, it's not just the story, it's that communal experience with the audience. So the audience is yet another participant in the evening. <laughs> It's the same thing in the studio production with the, with the studio audience, and that translates to a household. So it's how you share energy. And I think having theater experience with us, having all four, uh, Lucille, Desi, you know, uh, William, Vivian, Schmidt, Schmidt, all of us having theater background, it helped in the production of I Love Lucy. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, well, you're not it sounds like maybe similar. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, uh, I mean, yes, Aaron Sorkin's dialogue can be intimidating, but you know, great writing often is. And and once you 
you know, after you read it through for the first time and sort of, you know, recover from the shock and awe of, of the sheer brilliance of it, and then begin to go through it again, sort of from your character's point of view, and begin to understand, you know, you realize if you if, if you look deeply enough, there's not a syllable that's out of place. Everything is there for a very specific reason, and you just have to wrap your brain around that. And if you don't, you're working with Aaron Sorkin, the director, you know? <laughs> and, 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 when you're, and when there's a little beat that you kind of go, I, I'm just not sure I get this, he will find an answer for you, you know? <laughs> and, and, and to address your point about, about the, you know, being an actor playing an actor playing a character, you know, which, which the four of us all did, it's, it's, again, I think, the theater background certainly comes in there, in my case, and probably in everybody's, you know, where you're doing the play within the play, you know, I mean, I play Bottom in A Midsummer Night's Dream, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a, a not uncommon thing that's been going on for several hundred years, and one of the theater historians in the group might know, even pre-Shakespeare, you know, that there were, uh, you know, plays within plays, um, and it's always a, a delightful, uh, additional challenge uh, for me as, as an actor, and uh, it certainly was in this case. So I, I understand that he said to all of you guys early on, essentially you're not doing a, you know, an impersonation, but that you guys then still, of course, did a lot of independent work to, um, you know, prepare one aspect or another. Nicole, uh, I've heard, I guess, with you and, Javier stuff with the voices uh, and the, the dialect and just all of that. Um, but I guess the key, is, and I'd love to hear anything about all of that, but particularly the episode that is being dissected or coming together in this in this film uh, that week, uh, which is Fred and Ethel fight. Uh, you guys really studied that, right? And I know there. Are, uh, probably many episodes beyond that, but do you want to talk about, Nicole, watching? Even though you're not doing an impersonation, what was the primary reason for you to really study the show and specifically that episode? Well, and initially when, when we, he was talking about it, he would say, I don't want you to go and put prosthetics on and become Lucy. I'm not making the I Love Lucy show. That's been done, it's been done brilliantly, we're not doing that. What I want to do is I want to study these human beings and what it took to make the show and they then pull the veil back on um, the on them and it's a fascinating story. And that, that actually, when I read the screenplay, it, it's a fascinating story. I had no idea. He's compressed it into a week, but all these things happen. They didn't happen in a week. That's drama. He's made that dramatic, but they all happen. I mean, literally the moment when he calls Hoover, that happened. I was like, oh, you made that up right there. And he's like, no, I didn't make that up, that, that happened. Uh, so, but he wanted there to be Lucille Ball and Lucille Ricardo, and Lucille Ball created Lucille Ricardo, and that's her genius. And it wasn't easy, and it shows in the film, comedy is hard. And to just give a case in point, quickly follow up, uh, how, how many times did you or how many times I didn't answer you your question. No, no, we'll, 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 no, we'll combine this because it's related. I mean, the grape stomping scene. Yeah. How many times did you watch the actual one? I watched that show over and over and over again. I would go, I would have the screen behind me. I would have a movement coach. It was, a, it was during the pandemic, so it was a friend, and he was like, he's a dancer, and he'd be like, no, she's not moving like that. And I literally would work on each each moment, I'm gonna get up and do it for you. <laughs> but it was like between the every the circling and the timing, and then I would watch, and then I would pause, and then I would go back, and rewind, and go back, and and by doing that, gave it released me into the role. In the weirdest way, I normally go, okay, let's everything's gonna start here, and by starting externally, I was able to find her internally, if that makes sense, and. She was a clown, a beautiful, fantastic, brilliant clown who would do anything for a laugh. That is not me. <laughs> but, um, but I suddenly went, oh, I kind of like it. Um, I, wish I wish I had that talent, but I was able to sort of, you know, 
um, hook, hook my wagon to her. Yeah, it's <laughs> totally great. It was like watching her. So, um, Javier, I feel like people have not cast you often enough in comedy. You're, you're hilarious. And uh, I wonder uh, if you, if, is that something you've been yearning to do? Or is, I mean, I, I think of, uh, you've now covered pretty much the spectrum, but you go from no country <laughs> to this. Uh, you, can, you can do anything, but. <laughs> Well, uh, I guess uh, you need Woody Allen words or Aaron Sorkin words to be good for me. Uh, I'm not a, a comedian myself, like an artist or a genius of someone making standing comedy and making you like laugh nonstop. Like you need a good scene, a good circumstance, a good character to play, and a great director to shoot it in a way that is like funny. But, yeah, I was funny, I guess. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I want to ask about how much you guys, as these sort of, there's a very interesting dynamic between uh, Vivian and Bill, and I, I think that, I wonder if you guys coordinated your backstories as far as why they have this tension between them. I know they certainly, there's things that have been documented about why they might have been annoyed with each other, but did you feel a need to get on the same page before playing? I think we jumped right out of the first page because as we were both doing our research and, and I was reading books by or about Vivian Vance and Desi Arnaz and his, his brilliantly titled a book that he wrote <laughs> and, and the myriad of books by or about Lucille Ball. Um, they all, and, and even the Jess Oppenheimer, you know, some, some audio tape that, uh, that uh, I was able to find about Jess Opp from Jess Oppenheimer, um, they all referred to the first read-through of I Love Lucy and uh, Vivian and Lucille walking in together, who were already friends and become best friends, and uh, Vivian's laying her eyes for the first time on uh, Bill Frawley, who would be playing her husband, and saying loud enough for Bill to hear, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> that old coot is playing my husband. <laughs> and that relationship was immediately derailed and never got back on track. And they were bickering at each other, as you see in that table read scene for the entire run of that show and the Lucy and Desi comedy hour after that. <laughs> um. I mean, she wasn't wrong. <laughs> you know, I mean, the age difference is, a, is about the same as Nina's and mine. It's like, you know, <laughs> sorry, baby. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, well, this is just a, a random thought, but I mean, a number of you have worked at one time or another with a significant other on a movie. Uh, when you now see what these guys, these guys were together for years on a daily basis at work and at home. Can you imagine doing it for that long without driving each other completely insane? I actually would love that. I, I've never been married. <laughs> I just break way out. But <laughs> Bye. I just finished doing a film that my wife uh, directed and, and co-wrote and uh, uh, Listen, if we could get a long-running series together, I, I, I'd be down. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think I think it's. I mean, part of the thing is to be in the spotlight as a couple, showing, exposing their marriage, and even if it's in a happy way, for so many years, for so many millions of people, I'm sure it was affecting their own intimacy in some way or the other. I mean, of course, it, it cannot be the other way. Do you think that was part of the what uh, drove them apart beyond the infidelity, Nicole, or it was or it was? Primarily. No, I think that's what kept them together. I think, um, why don't people work out? I mean, every relationship ends. How does it end? Does it end because you die? Does it end because you break up? Does it end, but it ends. I think I prefer to focus on what they did do because I love them. They made an incredible show. They put good in the world. They gave us this wonderful, wonderful, timeless show. They also 
gave us inspiration because they created Desilu Productions as actors. They were the first to have a production company to say, no, we're gonna do it our way. We're actually gonna kind of break the mold. We're gonna take on the system. We're gonna do it together. And we're in love, but we're a fantastic creative duo. And they were, and they had each other's backs. And I love that. And, um, and you know, they didn't work out. They didn't make it to the very end. But hey, they had a great, great run at it. And I love that. So. Well, I'm gonna ask you guys to please help us because everybody is on a tight schedule up here tonight. If you would hold your seats, but or your oh, place. I you gonna ask questions. Well, I, I wish we had time, but I think that please, not about necessarily holding your seats, hold your place, because I know a lot of people want to get up and acknowledge. Thank you guys all for these great performances. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.